big problem is a lot of boards don't realize that the, 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 the grounds of war have completely changed. You know, you are, we are still fighting the wars of 20 years ago. Malaysia as a trading nation, we are a big cog in the entire supply chain. But unfortunately, you know, the type of markets that we are going into requires us to go and comply with certain sustainability metrics uh, and matrices, right? And if we don't comply with it, we are, we are out of a market. Viewers, welcome to another episode of CO to CO. Um, today with me, I have Tunku Ani Zakri. Um, and like me, a former May banker, and literally we're at Bursa today, which is just a step, a throwing uh, two steps <laughs> two from, steps, a, two two steps steps from our a old hop. office. <laughs> so first, thank you for coming in today. And thank you so much. Spending a little bit of time with us. Um, now, let's, a few ice-breaking questions. Coffee or tea? Coffee. How many cups in the morning? One. I can't take more than one. Only one? No, only one. I'm already hyper. Then what do you drink after that? Water. Hot, air, cold? Anything that comes my way. <laughs> Are you a morning or evening person? Evening. Well, you are creative. Totally. You are theatrical. Totally. So that makes sense. Um, Favourite movie? Wow, too many, too many, too many genres, maybe. I love uh, science fiction, fantasy science fiction. Next. Uh, oh. Okay, I, my favorite comic was X-Men. Okay. But unfortunately, my favorite movie is not X-Men because I think they've just made a total mess out of it. So I'm hoping that my favorite movie is about to come. So I'm still holding that out. Well, <laughs> hope springs eternal. Now. Play or musical? Oh, totally musical. <laughs> Come on, that's, just, that's not a question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, our, our viewers are getting to know you. We know each okay, other. Okay, okay, okay. All right, musical, musical. All right. Um, <laughs> define work-life balance. Mm, doesn't exist. Because for me, I think uh, life is work and work is life. And when you accept it as that, and when you actually take it as part of your passion and your purpose, suddenly, wow, you know, 24, 24 hours in a day is brilliant. He speaks my language. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, we have this conversation. Everyone's yeah. talking about work-life balance, etc. But the reality is simple. It's not binary. It's not binary. And, and you know, when, when, when you're leading a, uh, an organisation, I don't want the team who comes to work to sort of like say they put on their work mode and they leave their life mode behind. I rather a person comes in and they bring their whole person into, into being, into the office, you know. So it's not as easier said than done, of course. But can you imagine if you're only getting like 50% of the person? Well, we're but, a sum yeah. of parts, right? Only, so, yeah, yeah. And, you can't carve, and, it, carve and them out our decisions we make, yep. a reflection of the experiences we've had. Yep. Um, sometimes how we're feeling at the moment, to be frank. Yep. Now, favourite actor? Whoa. Oh, um, Helen Mirren. Okay. You know, have you seen that movie where, oh God, what was it? <sighs> where she was playing this uh, restaurant owner. Was it in, in, in France or something like that? And there was that pivotal moment when she was testing this person to, to, to see whether he can cook. So she asked him to go and make an omelette. So when she goes to, to take a bite, and it was her back who was talking because the camera was focused on her back. And the way she straightened and the way she did her back, it just spoke a hundred lines immediately of how she was astounded, you know. I mean, if you can act with your back, <laughs> you can act with anything, okay? Amazing. So fair yeah. cool. Place you'd love to visit in the world, or a place you have visited in the world, which I really love, Turkey. I unexpectedly love Turkey, you know, because uh, it's a big melting pot. It's it's a huge melting pot. It's huge history, culture, yeah. um, and it's also you know sometimes it's a bit of sign of the times, you know that that clash of uh, of, of civilization, clash of thinking, clash of ideology. It, in a way, it's sort of like what's happening in the world right now being put into that, that microcosm of that country. 
I mean, but apart from that, from a touristic perspective, when I was traveling around Turkey, and you're like literally clambering up and down the ruins, whereas those sort of ruins in other countries would be behind glass, you know, glass panels and all that. Here you are, I was in Perige, for example, it's a whole city of ruins. I was like climbing up, climbing down, going around, amazing, living history. Best advice you've received? This too shall end. <laughs> this is going to be perhaps the most difficult question because we've known each other for some time. Tell me something that I don't know about you. Oh boy. Not we don't know about you, <laughs> but I don't know about you. Hey. Uh... All right, let's go I, to know, we. That's difficult because, you know, because I'm quite an open person, unfortunately. You know, that, that's my problem. Sometimes I wear my heart on, the sleeve, on my sleeve and that gets me into a lot of trouble, right? Because when I don't like something, you, you literally know it, you know? And when I like something, you also literally know it. So uh, I've not done that much soul searching into myself because I've always lived for the moment and for myself in that sense. What you see is what you get. I hate duplicity. You know, I hate all the, the double layering of things. So uh, it's, it's very tough for me in, 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 in that sense. Sometimes I myself, I don't have too many private things even to myself. So a bit difficult to answer that question. All right, let's get into the nitty gritty. Okay. We've heard a lot about ESG recently and, and thinking about hat and MAFCAP. Um, so, can you share with us what are VCs looking for today and perhaps some of the thinking behind the criteria? Mm -hmm. uh, it's a bit of a mesh, uh, mesh mash of uh, old and also new. I mean, from the core basics, of course, you're looking for returns, right? Uh, you, you need to go and make sure that the type of investments that you're putting into would, would really uh, bear the results uh, that you want. Now, MAFCAP uh, being part of the government machinery, so the mandate goes just beyond uh, in terms of uh, financial returns. Because the returns, you also have to look in terms from this type of social returns, the type of infrastructure returns uh, from the investments that you make. Because as we all know, you know, the VC industry is going to be the next generator of ideas and economy for the country moving forward. So when from a math cap perspective, um, okay, uh, we're also looking at going into it from a fund of funds perspective. So we don't do too much direct investments okay. because again, the mandate is to look at the total VC infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And it's not just the investee companies, but also we want to go and grow the infrastructure of the fund management companies. Mm -hmm. Because you need to go and have this really healthy, combination of both in order for the VC infrastructure to, to, to grow. But the areas that we're actually looking, which is slightly more different where ESG comes into play, is that we are taking a much longer time frame. Because we know in any investments into sustainability type of assets or ESG type of assets, the type of returns you only see anywhere from seven to nine years. Yeah. Like if you are going into typical equity type of assets, what within three to five years, that's something that you should be looking for, right? Does, does that impact your ROI? I mean, because time is money. Yep. It yep. really is. Yep. And you front in load something, you get yep. a yep. bit of ROI, but you're taking a longer gestation Absolutely. period. Absolutely. Yep. And you're a fund of funds. How do you find the right fund? I mean, it's very interesting. How do you find the right f the, the fund that resonates, that, ha that is able to tailor? Because, I mean, with all due respect to uh, my cousins in the VC industry, hello, um, you know, it, it is about superior abnormal returns. And yeah. with, uh, clearly we're having a conversation about impact, yeah. uh, catalytic investments, uh, which Mavcap's all about. Um, and so you're going to have quite, I would think, discreet mandates from the traditional mandate. Yes. And in a way, it creates a quite interesting dichotomy also because as what you've mentioned, the typical fund managers, they're like saying time is money. You know, look, you want to go and look at anything from seven to nine years? Sorry, that's not for us because we have other investors mm -hmm. also, right? So in a way, uh, with this type of sustainability mandate that has been given to MAFCAP, it also allows us to look for fund managers which actually aligns with the right value systems. Mm -hmm. So, and, and, and it's quite interesting, you know, in the old days, I used to think, you know, all these venture capitalists, they are like, oh no, they are, they are heartless and it's all about money, money, money. But now you actually find the type of partners that we are going with, they also believe 
that in order for you to go and get real superior returns and long-term returns, you need to go and embrace that sustainability type of thinking. And you actually have to be patient for the sort of investments that you make. So uh, we've actually put money with uh, Gobi, uh, okay. with uh, f um, 500, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and I, I'm really glad to go and say, when I, especially when I speak to Tom and Kylie and all that, the alignment of purpose and the alignment of values is very consistent. So uh, partnerships, just like the, you know, we know the SDGs. Mm. Partnerships is a key component of the 17 SDGs, right? And so similarly with that type of thinking, we put it into the VC industry, especially with a government mandate in that sense to go and grow the VC industry. So then we allow ourselves to go and find the right partners to go and make it happen because no man is an island, right? No organization is an island. So, I mean, so we've got Mavcap, Fund of Funds, mm. then we have investee companies. How, I mean, interesting conversation. How do the funds engage the investee companies vis-a-vis mm. -vis ESG? Mm. I mean, we have a lot of debate about um, bringing people on the journey. I mm. mean, we, we hear this term journey so often mm. and it's probably abused. But the reality is it is a journey because mm. it is not binary. You don't wake up and bang. Mm. And you know, greening supply chains. Is there a responsibility to, to accelerate the adoption of ESG, or you're looking for companies that are already there? You know, in your old role, yeah, we used to talk yeah. about the abnormal return where you yeah. take a poor performer, yeah. and then we begin to yeah. engage management at the board and we begin to make them sustainable yeah. or get them to embrace um, principles that are aligned to our core values. Uh, which of course are under ESG, and that makes them more sustainable, more robust, and then that what we used to call the ESG alpha kicks in. So, yep. are you on that journey where you move people along, or are you looking for companies that are already there and mm. need help on the journey? Well, okay, to be totally open about it, even at MathCap level, we are very, very much in the early stages because mm -hmm. we are still debating even amongst ourselves what does sustainability mean to us. Right, because uh, I mean, if we look at a typical organization, when you want to come up with a sustainability strategy, I mean, the first step that you go into is the, the, the most obvious one choose which one of the 17 SDGs that you want to align to, and then after that, you link it into your core business and your core functions, and then you do your material, uh, materiality testing, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Right, but when you come to this um, a government type of organization, so the job that we do in itself is ESG, so to say, because we are actually trying to go and create jobs, create opportunities, bring in innovation, bring in technology, and also um, have a much more forgiving attitude, but yet with very tight controls on companies that are unproven for them mm. to, go, to, to grow, right? So, so the challenge is that we are developing in our early part of the journey. The fund managers, to a certain extent, I think they're slightly ahead of us. You know? So they themselves do have their own ideas of what is sustainable in their perspective. But then the big question is, you know, is it fair for us then to go and put a positive or negative screening on companies that they themselves are still in gestation period? Mm -hmm. So from, okay, and this is very much a personal perspective, I think at this point of time, it's not for us to go and make that call right up front because it's too new, you know, they're still embryotic, I, mm. would, I would actually say. Once they're actually, they've been, uh, okay, what's the right word, delivered, if that's the right yeah. word, you know? I think our job is then to go and work with them. So do you give, so you're saying, you, you like the idea, yeah. if I can, paraphrasing, you like the idea, um, the company starts on its journey, but you would anticipate the fund that you've invested in would nudge them in the right direction. Nudge, I like the right, right word, because I don't think it's our job to go and mandate to them that they have to follow a right or a certain path, because that would go against the VC type of thinking, because the innovation well, you, you right, in its own way. From them. You, know, you can guide them, right? But in another area that I, I'm also sort of like exploring is in terms of social enterprises, mm -hmm. because when I started thinking about you know, the successful local type of um, innovative companies like Grab. Mm. At the end of the day, Grab in itself is a social enterprise. Right? They were addressing uh, in terms of mobility, uh, uh, mobility issues. They are looking in terms of providing income security also for those who, who don't have a traditional job, for, for example. Right? And, and for me, when you actually have that sort of thinking, 
innovation is all about addressing problems. Mm -hmm. And in Malaysia especially, you know, we have a lot of social issues at this point of time, which is sometimes goes even beyond the capabilities of the government, right? So why not we open up to the people who actually knows what's happening on the ground, come up with solutions which is relevant and directly impactful to their own lives and support them in that journey. So in a way, their own business objectives is very much social in nature. So if I can give a shout out, you know, I, I, I visited Seed Labs. I don't know if mm, you've ever yeah. been there. You know, they are doing amazing work there. So for an oil and gas company to actually do Seed Labs, which is a social enterprise sort of like uh, think tank, right? Uh, to, to me, I think that's brilliant. And one or two of the things that uh, the young people that I was chatting with, they were talking about real issues that is just being debated at a very top level. But when it comes down to the ground, mental, uh, mental challenges, especially among the youth and the mm -hmm. students, right? So one team came up with a solution for that. Well, uh, you know, and we want to go and see whether we can actually make that as part of the curriculum for, okay. for, for, for Malaysian youth, for, uh, whereby they'll be able to use the app because they are more comfortable to use an app than to talk to their parents. Mm. Right, so maybe that might be one way. Uh, there was e even another social enterprise where they look at the issues again. There was a mobility issue in Sarawak, you know, in terms of transportation of goods from from um, I forgot was it Ranau, Ranau to uh, Kuching, I think if I'm not mistaken, right? So uh, and and just because there was those existing problems of delivering uh, parcels and products, they were looking at how do you make use of open spaces in lorries which goes up and down very frequently. Right? And again, it's all powered by technology. So to me, I think if you want to go and look at VC, the, the, the common mistake at this point of time is just look to look at technology for the sake of technology. When you invest into a technology company, it must be because of a purpose. And why? what problem is it trying to address? And if we want to look at it from a Malaysian context, to me, I think VC, uh, you know, for a startup company, there's so much potential here because there's a lot of challenges in, Mal in living in Malaysia at this point of time, which I think uh, technology as well as uh, startup companies can actually address. Yeah, I, I think technology for the sake of technology, well, that's intellectually interesting, but actually doesn't achieve outcomes. Mm. Mm -hmm. And so technology has to enable ease of use, solve a problem, or make an existing problem easier to solve. Yes. And if you can earn a modicum of income off that, because to be truly sustainable, it has to be sustainable. Yes. And in the sense, it has to pay its way. So there's some very interesting ideas. Now, uh, I think you've touched on a few interesting technology uh, enabling, um, you know, in our mind, it, it is about, um, this is my personal view, it's very much about social inclusion yes, and inclusive growth. Yes. Now, we hear a lot of conversations about it, but we're working very hard to bring MSMEs into the story. And so they're not, I don't want to have a two-speed economy. We, we should be trying to drive alignment and actually using ESG and mm. um, sustainability goals to actually drive ourselves in the right direction hmm. and enabling better outcomes uh, and that's probably a very nice segue into the next uh, piece uh, because you are a strategy fellow we, we know that <laughs> i like to think that so <laughs> organizations are usually guided by roadmaps framework absolutely. structure absolutely um as a board member uh, what are the common topics of discussion at this point in time about around sustainability no or just in generally or what's keeping your oh, fellow wow. independent non-executive directors awake at night? A lot of things. Uh, I mean, if you look at some of the facts of life that is uh, besieging us today, right? I mean, let's talk about um, Ukraine, Russia. Mm -hmm. Up till now, we, st we still see no uh, settlement to that. And the implications in terms of the power security. Mm -hmm in terms of the food security, mm -hmm. because fertilizer, a major part of fertilizer actually comes from that part of the world. I mean, we are seeing in terms of impact to inflation, mm. right? We are seeing in terms of labor issues. And of course, I think we talk about the climate crisis. And I think one of the main challenges is that the climate crisis is not seen as a crisis, unfortunately. You know, we forget that when we talk about the SDG goals, it's supposed to be achieved in 2030. Yes. We're already in 2023, which we are like seven years away. And we're only having very basic conversations at this point of time. And look, to be fair, 
it's because there's a lot of, again, as I said, you know, day-to-day -day challenges that is already happening, which you are grappling with. And, uh, and to a lot of companies, you know, looking at sustainability, if you look at that Maslow's hierarchy of mm. needs, right, it's actually not really seen as a requirement at the base, but it's actually seen as this very aspirational thing. Let's get the base sorted out before we talk about sustainability. Unfortunately, sustainability is not the apex of, of this, this, this pyramid. It's actually the entire thing. If you don't address sustainability at the core and the, and the foundation, you're not even going to be achieving it at the top level, you know, at that aspirational level. And that's the type of conversations which I find some boards are having difficulty in. Um, what sparks them into action is when the crisis actually becomes a real uh, crisis. Let, let's just, if I can... Just in pause. pause. Okay. No, pause. Because I think that's actually a very important point. A at the exchange, as you know, we're marshalling or encouraging greater disclosure, mm. uniform mm. disclosure. Mm. And there's a, to be frank, there's a lot of pushback, mm. which, which gets back to that very point that you raised. As a, it is a mouthful, independent non-executive director <laughs> talking to other independent non-executive directors, why should they make that investment? Uh, if you, because I found if you appeal to their altruistic nature, yeah. you get back to Maslow's hierarchy of need. Which is very Cause esoteric. Because they'll say, oh, that's aspirational. Yeah. Where I, I think the, the point is consumers make a difference and consumer behavior drives outcomes. Consumers are waking up to yes, it. Yes, yes, yes. So, I mean, okay, let's come back to the point of being strategic. Being strategic is not just about frameworks, it's also a mindset, mm -hmm. right? And being strategic, you have to go and look at anything that is happening as both a risk as well as an opportunity. Now, the, the, the challenge at this point of time with a lot of boards is that exactly what you were just mentioning, they look at sustainability as more of a compliance thing. You know, it's more about, oh, Bursa, Securities Commission, Bank Nagara, name it, you know, just fill in the blanks, is requiring us to go and comply with this and for us to go and fill in the blanks or fill in the forms. And then it just becomes a form filling exercise. Uh, I think more enlightened boards will actually look at sustainability at both from an opportunity perspective as well as also a risk perspective. Mm. From an opportunity perspective, markets, right? I mean, come on, we are looking at the growth of the youth uh, market. And we know that for youth, uh, sustainability is a major thing for them. It influences the, uh, the types of things that they buy, the food they consume, uh, the clothes that they wear, uh, the, the, the jobs that they actually follow through. So if you don't actually meet their requirements, you know, you, you're going to, you're not, you're going to be missing out on the boat. So you're not future proof. You're not future proofing, right? Number two, I mean, if you want to go and uh, position yourself from, hey, you know what, investors put money into me. Green assets, especially in, in, in uh, investment assets in Malaysia and our part of the world, is actually not that many. So can you imagine if you are a company which actually is a real uh, green investment target, I mean, people will be flocking to invest into your company because there's not enough, even in, uh, institutional investors, right? If I can just add on that, I often said, having these conversations, um, we're at war. Business is war. Mm -hmm. we're, we're fighting for market. We're fighting for geography. We, we're looking to make our businesses sustainable, future-proof, all these good things. There isn't enough points of differentiation from time to time. Yes. And here is something that you can embark on a journey you can start that is a fundamental point of differentiation that you can insert yourself into supply chains supply chain disruption is real absolutely um, we see in the headlines is china the manufacturing hub for the world anymore maybe not mm -hmm. i mean the the jury is out globalization is not happening right and so you know we're going to see distributed manufacturing absolutely yep. security of supply yep. is becoming a key issue and when we look at it, at the exchange, we're saying, let's green supply chains, let's make it possible for our SMEs in our PLC supply chain to insert themselves into new supply chains because you have people looking, you know, you have new businesses are now again looking for security supply. And the best way to do that is to diversify supply. Yes. Um, and so I think that's the point. 
perhaps people are not quite grappling with, because you fight so hard, have, have a unique point of differentiation that allows you to actually pivot. Because bearing in mind, as a trading nation, 70% of what we produce as a nation is, are going to countries that have quite sophisticated emissions trading schemes. They're looking to actually have cross-border pricing mechanisms. The C-band coming into play. And it's just going yeah. to... It, it's either it's it's not necessarily going to exclude us from market, but it's yeah. going to make our product more expensive. No, I mean, and I love the analogy that you actually use. You know that business is war. The big problem is a lot of bots don't realize that the the the, the grounds of war have completely changed. You know, you we are still fighting the wars of twenty years ago when things have completely changed completely. Like what you've just mentioned, supply chain issues. Um, Malaysia, as a trading nation, we are a. a, 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 a a big cog in the entire supply chain. But unfortunately, you know, the type of markets that we are going into requires us to go and comply with certain sustainability uh, metrics uh, and matrices, right? And if we don't comply with it, we are, we are out of a market. I mean, case in point, one of the boards that I was in, which was Saimdavi Plantations, right? We got hit because of, not from the E aspect, which is the sexy thing out there, but from the S aspect, mm -hmm. from the social, for a social perspective. It came completely from the left field in that sense, you know? And we were actually gobsmacked also because we were actually, uh, we were quite proud to say that from a social perspective, the labor practices of Saim Dabi Plantations are actually one of the highest mm -hmm. in Malaysia. But unfortunately, the message is not going out there. And I think this is where, now coming back to your point about Bursa, you're putting a lot of effort, putting frameworks into play and all that. But the thing is, the market people outside there, they don't see it as like Bursa is actually helping them up by creating proper frameworks to make you relevant in the global marketplace or the global uh, war, war grounds, right? So instead of looking at Bursa and SCA and all that as these very paternalistic uh, bodies with big sticks, look at Bursa and SCA as like, look, they are here to help you out to go and make you relevant in the future. The frameworks are there in order for you to go and take a deep look into yourself and actually see, hey, are you really following sustainability practices, which is a guideline, which is being followed in Malaysia, which can then be applied at international level rather than go out on your own, which was what happened at uh, with Saim Dabi plantations. Now, not to say anybody was at fault, but we were, you know, sustainability practices and guidelines were still early in this uh, um, history in Malaysia. So we had no choice but to go out on our own. But for other companies out there, you know, just use the existing guidelines that you guys are actually uh, implementing and introducing and look at it rather than something that's going uh, to go and constrain our business, but something that is going to unleash our business to the world. Well, I mean, thanks for that. I think that's really the key. I mean, we're very mindful when we put in disclosure mm. that there's a need to build capacity around it. Mm. Uh, and it doesn't happen overnight. And again, that J word, journey again. <laughs> but as in trying to explain why are we so keen, it, because it's very simple. We're the exchange. We're a market. Yeah. We are a supermarket for companies. Yeah. And as you go down that aisle, you'll be looking for certain products and branding. Do you want it at eye level or do you want it down there? And so we're <laughs> trying to bring all our companies to eye level. That's right. To make them desirable. Absolutely. And, and you know, as a nation, we strongly believe that we can actually lead ESG in ASEAN and actually make that drive. Because we have, what, 54.5 mm. plus percent forest cover. Mm. Um, you know, we're blessed with intelligent people, we have water, we have sun, we have all the ingredients. Of course, I have some points to poke at your numbers too. But I'm not, we're not going to go there, okay? yeah, not today. Fine. Today is all positive. Yeah, of course. <laughs> today, we have Tunku Ali Zakri, uh, the former CEO of EPF, the largest pension fund in Malaysia. Can you share some examples of how you've led an organization oh. into delivering high-impact oh, projects boy, you're and reading strategies? Through. I have to come up with my script now also. Oh, I've got to read it. No, but, I love it. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> well, anyway, okay. Um, uh, in EPF, um, we started the sustainability journey relatively mm. early, okay? And um, I, the, the good thing about being a uh, CEO is that you can actually lead by madness because your people have to trust you. <laughs> Well, I should like that. 
<laughs> no, right. no, it has to be, um, uh, you know, the madness of creativity and genius, not yep. the madness which gets you to Tanjung Rambutan. Eh? Quite early on, you know, I was pushing in terms of the issues of sustainability mm -hmm. very, very early on. And, um, and I pushed for the creation of the sustainability department and the investment uh, setup. Uh, and we put in the best of our resources, the best of our talents into that department. And I can still remember, uh, I, I received a small delegation from that team, hmm. the ones who trusted me enough and read, read my mood uh, enough to, to speak to me and say, boss, why are you punishing us? Why are you putting us into this, this department which has been cold storage? Because they didn't understand that sustainability was, was going to be the next big thing. Of course, yeah. I gave them an earful saying that, you guys, don't you realize that I've just put you into the pathway of greatness? I mean, in, in, not so many words, right? Um, and, and, and thank God they had enough trust in me to go and start developing that. And we were also lucky enough because we were early, we were able to go and work with, uh, and shout out to PwC, Andrew, hi. Yeah. <laughs> um, because there were not a lot of companies who understood, so we were able to grab that opportunity. Because now, if you want to go and get Andrew on your team, there's like really no way because he's just ah, way he's, too busy. He's Asia Pacific. Man. Yeah, he's just way too busy yeah. to do it. And one thing that we also realized with EPF, as you said, you know, we, are the, uh, we were the uh, um, seventh largest pension fund mm. in the world, uh, as well as also the largest pension fund, and which basically uh, owns everything in, in Malaysia. If EPF speaks, everybody listens. And, and what greater opportunity for us to go and make a great impact for Malaysia and for corporate Malaysia than by us coming up with some sustainability guidelines. So again, you know, uh, we were very careful not to be prescriptive because we ourselves didn't really un uh, know what was the future. It was still so early on, right? Yeah. So even in terms of uh, publishing our ambitions, you know, do we become net zero by 2030, by 2050? Will our investee companies be ready for it also? Right, because what you do, they have to follow. They will have to follow, right? And if you put that out as an ambition, you better be ready to follow up with it. Mm. Because can you imagine if we just say, by 2030, everybody, every, uh, every company in our portfolio must be net zero, my God, and if none are there, we are dead, you know, we are totally dead. So um, we had to have a lot of engagement with the mm -hmm. industry. And some of them actually, um, luckily, you know, they actually woke up. And I'm so proud to say that uh, Maybank actually came up with, uh, uh, with a headline. Uh, it came out in The Edge, if I'm not mistaken. And they, they actually quoted that EPF was the inspiration for Maybank sustainability journey. So that was, uh, that was something that was very proud for me to read. Uh, because we were able through our moral suasion, you know, and of course with a big wad of like investi investment money there, to actually persuade people to actually think about the future. And like Maybank uh, actually took it from a very positive aspect. Rather than taking it from like EPF is now mandating and we better do it, they actually said, hey, you know what, maybe let's look at making an opportunity out of this and really understanding where our, our borrowers are actually in. Are they sustainable, right? So they came up with quite a solid framework, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's an interesting point. How, I mean, in your mind, Malaysia, circular economy, doing good. We, often we talk about the virtuous cycle. We help companies raise capital. When they raise capital, they invest. Uh, they invest in people, they invest in machinery. Uh, we hope they make profit, they yep. pay tax, and it goes on. How, how, in your mind, how are we progressing on that journey as a nation? Uh, I think there's a bit of, there's a lack of clarity, I think. Because in, in, in pockets, like I think Bank Nagara is doing a great job. You guys are doing a great job. SC is doing a great job. You, 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 all of you have done your JC3s and all that, right? But I, sometimes I feel like you guys are too far ahead of the pack. Everyone is, is left struggling behind. And sometimes the rest of them don't actually realize that you guys also have helping hands out there if you only know where to look. Now, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Bank Nagara has a facility for transitions of SMEs, you know, to go into the, the, into the green economy and circular economy. But I think a lot of SMEs uh, don't know of the existence of that facility. Right, because I think there are some requirements for you to be able to get account for your carbon uh, uh, emissions and all that, which the tools are not available. And to me, I think that is something which I can not turn. I can't. Ah, <laughs> Ooh, that I mean, no, no, because it gets yeah. back to the point I was making yeah. about 
we can ask for this, that and the other, but if you don't provide the capacity to do, absolutely, then you're just frustrating people. And absolutely. so I think there are probably two elements, two hands to clap. I mean, think of this as rules, think of this as capacity. You only get, when you want to make some noise, you actually have to put the two together. Yep, yep. And so, and this may get back to some of the challenges you had time diving. Sometimes you're ahead of the curve and you lead. Now what we're but trying you, to do... When you lead also, you get all the arrows. Well, <laughs> we're right behind you. <laughs> um, and so I think that that's the, the interesting piece. Um, mm. Agility. Run lots of things, done different things. Mm. You see any common trends? Themes, mindset, themes mindset, that are coming up? Mindset, 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 mind, mindset. Because I've seen some big organizations pivot very, very quickly when the board and the management really uh, seize the opportunity. And I've also seen some smallish companies sort of like still dragging their feet because of fear, fear of change, right? Because in the sustainable economy, it, it literally challenges you to change everything that, that you used to think was true, mm -hmm. right? And that will also require you to literally go into a completely new industry. Do you have the courage? Do you have the conviction? Do you have the imagination to go into that, right? So bigger companies, to a certain extent, they have resources. They are able to go and take more risks, right? But for smaller companies, it's a bit scary for them. And this is where the capacity capabilities that is being provided by, by, by the um, uh, regulatory side mm -hmm. can help them, you know, to go and cushion that type of risk. From the bigger organizations also, I mean, um, you have the resources, make use of it, because if you don't embrace that change is upon you, you're going to be stuck in the past and you're just going to be made irrelevant. Should large companies bring their smaller business partners on the journey with them? Oh, totally. Scope three. <laughs> well, no, because you, you could be... Uh, a little bit binary with that and just find new suppliers who meet your scope three requirements. Uh, now, we, we, our engagement is to bring everyone together because we talk about inclusion um, because clearly the pivot can be disruptive. There is threat in change and we need to remove objection. Yep. yep. And I think that's a very important conversation that we need to put out there and yep. be having more often. Yep. That how do we transition? What does that require? And, you know, uh, let's be frank, there, there's a subsidy in petrol, there's a subsidy yes. in electricity. Yes. And until you, and water to some extent, uh, until you price, price, price in yes. the true price, yes. people's behavior doesn't change. doesn't change. That being said, we also have to recognize as a nation the journey we're on and where we are and people's purchasing power but to make a just transition. That? But are people ready for that? You just mentioned, you know, we are a, a society that is so used to subsidies, right? And, uh, and, and subsidies works when, when it should be used when it's in times of emergency or great change. And also if the government has enough uh, firepower in your, you know, the war chest. But at this point of time, do we have the luxury of providing subsidies for the change for the people? Are we able going to go and cushion the people on the ground, the individuals on the ground, who's now, once we come into pricing, the real pricing, and you have to go and bear for it, who pays for it at the end of the day, right? Well, I, I think, I mean, it, it, we, there's been a lot of conversations about target subsidies, but that's what's necessary. Because, I'll be frank, when I fill up my car with petrol, I benefit. Well, actually, I don't, because I use the more expensive petrol. Mm. But people will naturally just use whatever they use and you have a different price point and someone who night chuck chai uses a liter of petrol versus yeah. a car that's using multiple liters of petrol um, of course that's a value judgment and government needs to assist us with that but i think that's a very important point that we don't have unlimited finances we don't have but yeah. we yeah. need to bring people along because we also have to recognize well, poverty is real and post-COVID, um, urban poverty or that, that you know, has swelled because COVID really you know, did actually impact society dramatically. Absolutely. And, that, and from, a health, Absolutely. from a health perspective, we're very Absolutely. lucky that yeah. we have a strong health system. So yeah. we navigated it, but the social impact is still there. Yeah, Absolutely. Now, I think it's probably you know, 
we've talked about change, we've talked about agility, but there are constants, mm. things that are true, mm. you know, that are behind our purpose. Mm. Your thoughts on that? Guiding uh, principles that just have to be. I mean, of course, I don't know, you know, integrity, uh, we must be honest, etc., mm. etc., etc. Going to be slightly, uh, some people might find this unacceptable. But I think my core message whenever I'm talking to the management of the companies that I'm in, don't just do good for the sake of doing good. The whole point of you doing business is you are here to make a profit. Yes. But sustainability is about how you make the profit, mm. right? Because some management sometimes, they, they, are, they are suddenly going on this crusade of this. That's the other end of the spectrum of sustainability, you know? But you won't be there in the long term. You won't be there in the long term because you're not focused on your core competencies and your core capabilities and you get distracted. Right? And at the end of the day, I mean, you are there for a purpose, which is to go and uh, make money for your uh, shareholders and your investors. But it's the way that we actually do it that will differentiate you. And that's the, the part where sustainability comes into play. So I think that is sort of like a cautionary tale. And, and that's a job of uh, the board to always bring back management, bring back management. Does it make sense to the business? Does it follow our cost structure? Will it actually unlock new revenues? Will it actually position us correctly? I mean, avoiding greenwashing, of course, mm -hmm. you know, be true to your value systems. And sustainability at the end of the day is a mindset and a value system. It's not a fad. You know, it's not something, a reporting or compliance requirement, but it's, 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 it's a lifestyle. It's the DNA of what makes you who you are. It needs to be embraced and it needs to mm -hmm. be pervasive. Mm -hmm. How you do what you do and it becomes a core of how you approach what you do. Mm -hmm. Now, one fad after another fad, but the rea simple reality is because it is so pervasive in our businesses, as we, you know, sustainable profits. Mm. We hear a lot about profits, we hear a lot about sustainability, but we now put them together mm -hmm. to say, if you're not profitable, you won't be sustainable. Mm -hmm. And if you're not sustainable, you're you not won't be, be profitable. profitable. In yes. the longer term. Yes. And on that note, thank you, sir. Thank you very much.